Hi, I'm Ashley Bockenstead, and I am the Joint Camp Educator for Mercy One Des Moines. And today I'm going to walk you through a presentation that will be very helpful for you in preparing for your upcoming hip or knee replacement surgery. And of course, if you ever have questions or concerns, you can always reach back out to us. Our contact information is in your book. The book that you do have, that Joint Camp book, a lot of this is in there as well. So it's very important to read through that and maybe have it out with you as we're going through this presentation together. All right, so today what our main topics that we're going to work on here is we're going to discuss what to expect after surgery and ways to start preparing now. And then we're also going to talk a little bit about your surgery and your hospital stay. So first of all, what is joint camp? A joint camp is a wellness-based concept. People that are coming in for this surgery are considered healthy adults. You're getting all these doctor checkups and things done to make sure that you are healthy enough to have the surgery. So since you are a special group of people here, we did develop this unique concept that's designed to get you on the road to recovery sooner by getting you home faster. It's better to be home as soon as you're able to get there to be able to move more often and be in the comfort of your own home does help a lot with your healing process as well versus staying in the hospital if you don't need to be here. So most patients are ready to go home after a one night stay in the hospital. They are discharging the very next day before lunchtime. Prior to discharging, we will wanna make sure that you are safe. So before you can leave the hospital, you will work with our team, our therapy and nursing team, to make sure that you can meet these following activity goals before you discharge. So we wanna know that you can transfer from a bed to a chair. We want to make sure you understand your weight bearing status, how much weight you're allowed to put through that leg and demonstrate that safely. We want to know that you can get yourself dressed and cleaned up, showered with little or with no help or maybe just a little bit of help from your, your coach, your, your support person that's at home. Know how to take care of your bandage, know how to get in and out of a bed, up and down from a chair, in and out of a tub shower combo if you have a tub that you have to step over. If you do have the option to use a walk-in shower, that is a lot easier to do. But we can safely teach you how to do a tub shower and we will have some videos to show you later on in this presentation. We also wanna make sure that you can walk a safe distance with your walker crutches. It's not how long you can walk or how fast you can walk, it's just that so you can get from one place to another safely. We also want to make sure you understand the exercises. The exercises are so important in helping you get back um, with your strength and your motion after surgery. So we're gonna go over those today as well. And then stairs, going up and down stairs are also very, help, um, are very important to be able to do after surgery. Even if you don't have stairs, they sometimes have you practice a step just so you're comfortable if you were to encounter a curb. So stairs are doable, they're exhausting. Try to avoid them as much as you can, but you will be able to do them after surgery. So discharge planning begins today. We are going to work on making sure you have a good plan in place to make it easier for you to discharge home after surgery. Again, discharge does typically take place on post-op day one. That's one day after surgery, usually that um, in the morning, later in the morning towards lunchtime is when most people are discharging. Of course, you have to have permission from your surgeon and the medical doctor before you can leave. They're looking at things like your labs and your vital signs, your pain control, um, making sure that everything's okay for you to be able to go home. Other things to be doing now to prepare, you might wanna check with your insurance company to know your co-pays. The orthopedic offices do any prior authorizations that are needed, but they're not necessary necessarily finding out the dollar amount that you need to know. So if you have a copay, deductible left, make sure you figure out what you're financially going to be responsible for before you come in for the surgery. Also, if you have any paperwork required by your employer to have the time off to be able to recover from this, or your coach needs paperwork filled out so they can take some time off to help you recover, please get that paperwork to your surgeon's office before your surgery. Don't bring it day of surgery. Um, prescriptions for pain medications and uh, blood thinners, you will be expected to have to probably pay a copay if you have to pay a copay for prescriptions for those things, so be prepared for that as well. You will have those prescriptions automatically sent to your pharmacy for you after surgery. 
And then anything else specific the doctors do, don't want you doing, we're gonna go over a lot of that today in this presentation and after surgery with you as well. So one of the most important parts of this recovery process is the exercises. We really need to work on these exercises to get the strength in our muscles. Even if you do a lot of exercising now, these particular exercises that are in your book really focus on those special muscles around those joints that are going to be impacted from the surgery. So we do ask that you start these exercises now. They are in your book. Exercises for knees start on page 25 and for hips they start on page 28. We will also have some links for you to be able to see the therapist doing these exercises and instructing you how to do them. But first we will want you to start them now. You'll start with 10 repetitions twice a day and gradually work your way to doing 20 repetitions twice a day. Anytime you start a new exercise routine, soreness is to be expected. Your muscles will feel a little sore after you do these. So don't stop doing them because of that. However, if you have sharp shooting pain as you do a particular exercise, that's the arthritis in the joint, that exercise you can stop. But do continue with the others that don't cause the sharp shooting pain. You should also be doing these exercises in a position where your legs are supported. So a recliner chair, a bed, a couch, a chair with a foot rest, those are all options for you to be able to do these exercises. Please do not get on the floor to do the exercises. That will be hard to get back up afterwards. For day-to-day -day activities, things such as going up and down stairs, getting in and out of a bed, in and out of a tub shower, up and down from a chair or a toilet, into a car, uh, we do have some video clips that will demonstrate for you how to do that. You can also find some pictures and instructions on pages 43 through 49 in your joint camp book. It's good to start practicing doing it these ways this way now so that you are used to it for after your surgery. Pain management. When it comes to pain, we want to make sure your pain is well managed after surgery. The one thing we can guarantee you right now is the day-to-day -day arthritic pain in that joint will be gone immediately. You've just had a surgery to clean that arthritis out, so that is gone. Unfortunately, though, we will still have pain, but it will be surgical pain. Surgical pain will eventually get better. But in the meantime, we will want to work on managing that surgical pain so that you can do your exercises and up and down stairs and in and out of the car and these day-to-day -day things that you need to be able to do. So page 20 in your book does have a nice section about pain management and different things that you can do to help with managing your pain. The scale that we like to use is a zero to 10 pain scale. Zero being no pain, 10 is the worst you've ever had. Try to get comfortable using that scale now. I do prefer the faces. I feel it's a little easier to point to a face that resembles how I'm feeling than to think of a number. What we are looking at here is what are you able to tolerate? Our goal for you after surgery is to keep that pain tolerable. Pain-free is not a realistic goal. The goals are that it's tolerable for you to move and do the exercises and it's tolerable enough for you to at least get some rest when you want to get some rest. Other things that we do um, that we'll encourage you to do to help with pain management is use the Joint Camp Journal. So page 39 to 41 in your book has some really great charts that you'll use after your surgery. The first chart is for your exercises. Movement does help. The first couple movements might not feel great, but you will start to notice the more you do, the better it does start to feel because stiffness is a big factor there with that pain. So you gotta keep moving to keep the stiffness away. The next chart in that book is for your pain medications. It's much better to stay ahead of the pain than it is to play catch up. So you need to keep track of when you take your pain pills. So write down the name of the pain pill you're taking and each time you take one, make sure you note what time that was at. And then the third chart that's there is for ice and elevation. Swelling is what causes a lot of the discomfort. And if we are having a lot of swelling, it doesn't help with your rehab either. You won't be able to bend your leg as well to work on your range of motion. 
and it'll be harder to walk on it when it's swollen. So we really gotta help keep that swelling down. One of the best ways to do that is to fight gravity by elevating. And when we mean elevating, we mean toes above your nose. So you'll want to be in a position like a recliner or a bed where you can lay your head back as flat as you're able to tolerate and, and get some pillows underneath your ankle to help get that leg up so that your toes are above your nose. You'll also want to use cold therapy. Heat will increase swelling, so no heat, but cold therapy will be very helpful in managing that swelling after surgery. Here in the hospital, we will give patients that had their knee replaced a machine that's filled with water, plugs into an outlet, a pad goes around your knee and it circulates cold water through that pad and you will be able to take that home with you for about five, six weeks to use for your recovery. Hips, we do use bags with ice in the hospital and you can take some extra bags home with you from the hospital to fill with ice at home. Or I do have two really fun ways to make your own cold therapy pack. Uh, one of them is a gallon Ziploc bag and a bottle of Caro syrup, clear corn syrup. Dump it in a gallon Ziploc bag, double bag it, put that in the freezer. It makes a really great gel pack that can mold around your joints. Another way to do that is if you have rubbing alcohol at home, you do one cup of rubbing alcohol with every two cups of water in a gallon Ziploc bag. So I do have some people that say they do two cups, of the rubbing alcohol, four cups of the water to really fill the bag up. And it will also turn it into a nice gel consistency that can mold around your joints. And those stay really nice and cold and work really well for helping to manage that swelling. So the chart there tells you how many times a day you should be doing this. Six times a day, 30 minutes each time, toes above your nose and cold therapy on that joint. These first couple weeks are a full-time job recovering from this surgery, so make sure you're really taking a lot of time to elevate when you're not up and moving. Around two weeks, it will get better as far as the discomfort and the swelling, uh, but don't be surprised if you're having to do these things pretty routinely those first couple weeks. Other things that often occur after surgery that we want to be mindful of, constipation. When you're on pain medications and you had a big surgery like this, it does mess with your bowels. So you'll wanna be very proactive when it comes to your bowels and have a bowel regimen available at home. So page 35 in your does book. does have a list of over-the-counter options you can get at any local pharmacy. A bowel regimen does consist of a stool softener and laxative. So we'll want you to have those options and to keep track of your bowel movements. Every two to three days, you should be having a bowel movement. If you go three days or more without one, we would like you to call your primary care provider because you're at risk for a bowel obstruction. Lack of appetite is something else that people will sometimes complain about after surgery. Uh, the pain medication sometimes can affect how hungry you might feel or what you want to eat. It is important to still eat after surgery and to be having bowel movements regularly even if you aren't eating. Foods that are high in fiber like fruits and vegetables would be good to help with your bowels and lean proteins help with muscle and tissue healing. So having a lot of good protein in your diet after surgery is very helpful. Again that surgical leg swelling tends to really surprise people once they get home after leaving the hospital. It will swell and if you are not elevating enough it will get all down your leg. So really elevate toes above the nose as much as you can during the day. Surgical leg bruising is also very normal. And because of gravity, you might notice a lot more of this bruising behind the leg and it can work its way down. You could wake up one morning with black and blue toes. So nothing too alarming, noticing that bruising all the way up and down, very, very normal. Uh, difficulty sleeping at night. This tends to be kind of a long-term complaint from people. Uh, they have trouble sleeping at night. You know, it, during the day, it gets, you get to a point where it's easy to distract yourself and not think about that little ache that you got going on in your joint. But at night, it's harder to uh, ignore that. So difficulty sleeping at night can happen. Obviously, things that you could do before or to help with that is to limit daytime naps so that you're more sleepy at night. Uh, also, take a pain pill before you go to bed at night to help get rid of some of that discomfort and follow up with your primary care provider if that does continue to be a concern. We do hear a lot of people choose their recliner to sleep in for those at least those first few days after surgery as it is 
a little easier to get in and out of when you do want to change positions and things if you're uncomfortable. And then a post-op blues. It takes a while to recover from the surgery and sometimes that just mentally wears on people. They just want to be better. It's not going as well as they had hoped or as fast as they wanted it to. And it can be very exhausting if you're not getting enough sleep and having all this aching. So very typical some, that people will have some kind of post-op blues. We're here for you. You can always call us, reach out to us so we can discuss your progress if you'd like. Also, not a bad idea. You don't usually follow up with your orthopedic office until two weeks. Maybe check in with your primary doctor within a week from surgery. That way they can address constipation, they can address your leg swelling, making sure it's not a blood clot or something else more serious. Uh, blood pressure, blood sugars, those are all things that the surgery can mess with afterwards. So it's good for them to kind of look you over and make sure that you are doing well with, with your recovery process also. Other things that are, you are at risk for when you're having this surgery, they're not good things, so we do need to go over them so that you're aware of them and you know what you can do to prevent them. Luckily, we don't see them a lot because there are a lot of things we can do to reduce the risk. So we're gonna be discussing blood clots, pneumonia, infection, hip dislocations, and falls. Risk factors for blood clots are immobility, not moving enough, trauma, which the surgery is considered trauma. If you're overweight or obese, if you smoke, those things do increase your risk for blood clots. Typical sign and symptom of a blood clot is usually increased pain or tenderness in the calf muscle, that muscle behind your leg. Uh, patients who have had them before describe the pain as like the worst Charlie horse they could ever imagine. So very intense, sharp pain, pain pills don't help it. There's also usually a lot of swelling that goes along with that. Um, elevations not helping with the swelling. So if you notice swelling, increased redness, warmth, um, warmth to the touch, and a lot of pain, if you try to move, walk on your leg, that pain just gets worse, call 911, get immediate medical attention. If it were to become a blood clot in your lungs, that's called a pulmonary embolism, that could cause some chest pain, shortness of breath. Uh, again, 911 phone call if you were to notice that. So we don't want these, we're gonna do our best to prevent them. So what can we do? Well, one of the big things is get up and move. Getting up and walking often helps get that blood circulating in your legs. However, the more you get up and walk and the longer you're up and walking, the more swelling and pain you can get in, in your joints. So you gotta find a nice balance act. So when you get home these first couple weeks after surgery, we do recommend that every hour during the day, you get up to do a walk. That walk includes the trip to the bathroom. So it's not on your feet for a long period of time and standing there for long periods of time. It's just to go to the bathroom, back, now you're sitting down elevating your leg again. An hour goes by. Well, if you don't need to do the bathroom again, then it's a lap around the kitchen table and sit back and elevate your legs again. So every hour during the day, get up to do short little walks. And then um, calf pumps, ankle pumps, that uh, very first exercise that the therapist went over with you where you're moving your feet up and down, it's good to do those off and on throughout the day as well to get that blood circulating. You'll also be on a blood thinning medication. Page 36 in your joint camp book does describe those blood thinners a little bit more and also has a list of all the different options a surgeon will take into consideration when they're trying to decide what they want to put you on. It's very typical that you'll probably be on a blood thinner for four to six weeks after surgery to help prevent blood clots. Pneumonia is something else that you're at risk for when you're having the surgery. With the sedation from anesthesia, the pain medications, it does suppress your respiratory system. And if you're not taking good deep breaths, that does put you at risk for pneumonia. So things we're gonna do to help prevent pneumonia, again, it's good to get up and move frequently. When you get up and walk, you can take bigger, deeper breaths than when you're scrunching a bed or a chair. Uh, the incentive spirometer is something else that we're gonna ask that you use after surgery. The nurse will instruct you how to use this. It is a little apparatus you'll use to inhale on. We'll ask that you do 10 of them every hour while you're awake here in the hospital. And then we will want you to take it home with you, doing it two to four times a day for the first couple weeks after your surgery. And another thing, of course, is the vaccines, pneumonia vaccine, influenza vaccine. 
it is good to be updated on those before you come in for surgery. So do talk to your primary doctor and get those. It's okay to get them before surgery. Ideally two weeks before, but even if it's a week or a few days before, that'll be fine. And it will help your immunity be stronger for when you're here in the hospital. Infection is something else that you're at risk for. Uh, typical sign and symptoms of infection is redness, warmth, swelling, or pain, fever of 101 degrees Fahrenheit or higher, and that foul, smelly, pussy-looking drainage. We are below the national rate when it comes to joint replacement infections, and we definitely want to stay there. So we do have some things that we do that will ask that you even start at home to help prevent those infections. Obviously though, if you do feel you have an infection coming on after surgery, call your surgeon's office. They always have somebody on call, even if it's in the middle of the night or a weekend, just call that number so that you can talk to them and they'll give you further instructions for what to do. So prior to coming to the hospital in order to help prevent infection, we are gonna ask that you start showering before surgery with a special antiseptic soap called Hibiclens. The generic is chlorhexidine gluconate. There is a handout in the very back pocket of your book that has all these instructions that I'm about to go over with you. So make sure you're able to find that handout and go through that when you start the showering process. You can buy this bottle at any local pharmacy. You do not need a prescription for it. It does come in different sizes. You'll want at least a four ounce bottle to do this pre-op shower process. If you shave your legs, you'll stop shaving your legs when you start this Hibiclens. You will use this Hibiclens a total of three times. Start two days before surgery, the day before surgery, and the morning of. So no more shaving your legs where you could get a cut or a scrape on your surgical leg when you are um, getting ready for the surgery. Just keep in mind that this is an elective surgery and these surgeons can be very picky. They don't want that risk for infection. So prior to surgery, if you do get some kind of cut or scrape on your surgical leg, I would definitely give your surgeon a heads up on that before you have to come in for, before you try to come in for your surgery. So two days before surgery, you'll take your first shower. Do not use this soap or this Hibiclens on your head, face, or genital area. Everywhere else though, we will like you to wash with it from the neck down. So a fresh, clean washcloth, about one third of the bottle on the washcloth, wash from that neck down. Keep in mind, this does not lather very well, but as long as you use about a third of it, you should be fine getting it from the neck down on your skin. It also does have a pinkish tint to it, so be cautious if you're using white washcloth. Um, so once you've washed with it, rinse it off, dry off a clean towel, put on clean clothes. Do not use any lotions or powders or creams on your skin after. Those things can harbor bacteria. The day before surgery, you're going to shower again. Wash your head, face, gentle air with your regular products. Another fresh, clean washcloth, one-third of the Civiclin soap from the neck down. Rinse it off, dry off a clean towel, put on clean clothes, clean bed sheets on your bed that night. Do not allow your pets to sleep with you, and no lotions, powders, creams, hair products, makeups, or deodorants after you do this shower. A lot of people do choose to do the shower at night. That way, they can still put their deodorants and things on to go to work that day, and then they'll come home and shower with this HIVA cleanse to clean all that off. The day of surgery, you're gonna wash with the soap one more time, but this time we want you to let it air dry on your skin. So you're gonna do a sponge bath with it. You can still get in the shower to wash your head, face, gentle area like you normally do, but then you'll turn the shower off. We'd recommend you get a bowl or basin that you can fill up with some warm water, dump the remaining one third of the Hibiclin soap in that bowl of water, fresh clean washcloth, dip it in and start washing from the neck down. That washcloth is considered dirty once it touches you, so it's a fresh, clean washcloth every time you dip it back in the bowl. You might need two or three washcloths to do this process. So you'll uh, wash from the neck down with it, let it air dry. We will know if you did it correctly, you'll complain about it. It's gonna leave a sticky, tacky feeling all over your skin, but that is that antimicrobial layer of protection that we want to help prevent infection. So once you're dry, put on fresh, clean clothes. Again, no lotions, powders, creams, hair products, makeups, or deodorants. 
You can certainly bring those to the hospital with you though, because you can put them on after surgery. We just don't want them on prior to surgery. Other things we're gonna do to help prevent infection, you will get IV antibiotics here in the hospital, one dose before surgery, a couple doses after surgery. The surgery environment's a very sterile environment. They're gonna do an antiseptic prep on your leg again when you do get here for surgery. Sterile drapes go around you and your surgeon and his team are all dressed in sterile gowns and gloves and, and things like that. The nursing unit that you're gonna stay the night on is aseptic clean technique. So staff coming in and out of your rooms will, if they're wearing, if they need to change your surgical dressing or will be coming in contact with body fluids, they're wearing gloves. And then hand washing is the number one way to stop the spread of germs. So not only do we encourage our staff to wash their hands as they come and go from your room, we are gonna ask that you do so as well, especially the coaches and visitors, as they'll come and go a lot more often. Use the hand sanitizers that's right inside or outside every patient room. You will have a surgical dressing on your incision after surgery, and these dressings are water resistant, so they will protect your incision. You do not have to cover your incision with anything when you're showering. You will leave that surgical dressing on until your first follow-up appointment. So showers after surgery are fine. However, it does take about six weeks for those deeper soft tissues to heal. So no submerging your leg underwater, like in a bathtub, swimming pool, hot tub, for about six weeks. Be aware if you're pets, if you have pets at home and they're licking you, that's a source of infection. So keep washing your hands and keeping things clean to help stop infections from happening. Also, when it comes to dental work, there are known relations between infections in the mouth leading to infections in a joint. So we want to do what we can to help prevent that from happening. Prior to surgery, if you have any concerns going on in your mouth, you need to have some dental work done. That should be done well before you have the surgery. Most surgeons are cautious if there's any dental work done within four weeks of the surgery. So if you have something other than just a routine cleaning that needs to be done, make sure you're checking with your surgeon's office first. After surgery, as long as it's not an emergency, Emergencies happen, you need to get taken care of, but for just routine care, routine dental cleaning, they are gonna ask that you wait three months from your surgery before doing that, and also they'll wanna prescribe an antibiotic for you to take prior to having that routine cleaning or dental checkup. Your surgeon will prescribe this for you, and they may want you to do that for the rest of your life before going to the dentist, take an antibiotic before that procedure. Increased falling is something that we are concerned about after the surgery as well, especially while you're here in the hospital. It's an unfamiliar environment. You don't know where things are located. There's a lot of medical equipment in, that are in the rooms that, with cords and things, so we do not want you getting up on your own. Blood pressure sometimes can take a while to stabilize after surgery, so lightheadedness, dizziness, sometimes people do experience that when they go to get up for the first time afterwards. We want to be there. Please call us anytime you go to get up and move while you're here in the hospital. At home, you'll wanna think about preventing falls as well. In your book, page 33. You have a lot of nice safety tips that I'm gonna encourage you to go to later to get that home set up, like getting throw rugs picked up and night lights so you can see where you're going in the morning. And the other big thing is keep using your walker or crutches at all times when you're up and moving. Therapy or your surgeon will guide you on when you can get rid of your walker or crutches after the surgery. A lot of people, m most people probably use the walker or crutches for a week or two, and then they're able usually to progress onto a cane after that. But your therapist or your surgeon will guide you more on that later. Dislocations of total hips. The posterior approach is the most common hip approach that's done, and those do affect some very important muscles around your hip joint. So while those muscles are a little weak and needing some time to heal, again, it takes about six weeks for those deeper tissues to heal, you could dislocate your hip with certain movements. If you were to dislocate it, you would know it would hurt. Um, things that 
have been known to put people at risk for dislocating are extreme flexion, bending over to pick up something off the ground, adduction is where you cross your legs, or internally rotating and pivoting on that surgical leg. Those are things we're gonna ask that you avoid doing for about six weeks. There are tools that help after a hip surgery. It's called our hip kit, a reacher, dressing stick, long-handled shoehorn, sock aid, a long-handled sponge, and a black pair and white pair of elastic shoelaces. You'll be taught how to use those tools and you are able to purchase them if you'd like. It is $35 cash or check only. And those tools are very nice because it allows you to do things on your own, like get dressed and get your shoes on where you don't break those hip precautions. If you do any recreational drugs, alcohol, or tobacco prior to surgery, it is best to quit as soon as possible. Smoking and alcohol do lead to a higher chance of wound breakdown, greater chance for surgical site infections, interrupts your sleep cycle, and smokers do have an increased risk of implant loosening and longer operative times. When we do see complications, this is one of the first things that I think about. Were they a smoker? Were they a heavy drinker? because there is usually a correlation between that. Do not be afraid to tell us what it is you use and how much we want to take good care of you. The earlier you can quit, the greater your chances are of avoiding surgery-related complications. The body begins to heal within hours of quitting and it takes just less than a day for blood flow to improve. So every day that you can quit before surgery will help a lot with your healing. Even if you like to just have a drink of wine with dinner at night or a beer with dinner at night, we will ask that seven days prior to surgery you stop doing that. And if you do need help with quitting or uh, more resources, talk to your primary doctor. They would have lots of different resources they could offer you. Preparing for the surgery, your joint camp education book that you got in the mail is very helpful so make sure you do read through that there's an outline starting on page 11 with weeks leading up and days leading up of different things you can be doing to prepare for the surgery one of the big important things to do to prepare for surgery is to find a coach the coach is that support person that recovery buddy that you can rely on to help you after surgery and we do like patients to have a coach because this is a lot for a patient to have to go through. And while they might do well here in a hospital, they are on pain medications and it's pretty fast, so just a one night stay. So we do have patients kind of describe the hospital stay as a blur. They don't remember much. So having a coach present, not on pain medications, they can remember a little bit better how you're supposed to do stairs, how you're supposed to do those exercises, get in and out of bed and be able to reinforce that for you when you're home if you are struggling a little bit with that. So we do ask that coaches, you're welcome to stay the night if you want. If you're not gonna stay the night or nearby, we ask that you do arrive that next morning, usually by eight, no later than 8.30 that morning after surgery so that you can be here when therapy and the nursing and the doctors are all here talking with the patient. Other preoperative guidelines to follow is st stopping certain medications that can thin your blood. This does include herbal supplements, so any non-prescription, over-the-counter supplements that you take, if you could stop those at least a week, I know I hear a lot of doctor's offices say a week before, our book says two weeks, so at least a week before stopping medications like fish oil, vitamin E, glucosamine, garlic, ginseng, turmeric, flaxseed oil, preservisions, biotins. Um, if you have other questions, uh, your primary doctor can also guide you on certain medications if you need to know about stopping or not stopping. A multivitamin with an iron supplement in it is fine. That ac iron actually will help you build up that blood supply for when you do lose a little bit of blood after surgery. The anticoagulants, these are prescription blood thinners like Coumadin, Warfarin, Plavix, Agronox, Bradaxa, Zeralto, Eliquis. Uh, those need to be stopped. However, it does vary when it's safe to stop it. And because of which one it is and why you're on it. So do talk to your primary doctor if you're on one of those medications so that they can advise you how many days before surgery to stop. Aspirin, if you're on aspirin for heart reasons, you've had a heart attack or a stent, again, ask the doctor about when you should stop aspirin. If you're just taking aspirin more as a preventative, then seven days before you should also be stopping that aspirin. 
Other medications you should stop seven days before are anti-inflammatories or NSAIDs. This includes Aleve, Naproxen, Motrin, Advil, Ibuprofen, Mobic, Relafen, Declofenac, Celebrex. Some surgeons are okay with Celebrex, so you'd want to check with them if you're currently on that, but all the other NSAIDs do need to be stopped seven days before surgery. Tylenol or acetaminophen is okay to continue up until surgery. If you already have a prescription for hydrocodone or oxycodone or tramadol, those are fine to continue as well. The week of your surgery, you'll get a call from the pre-surgery team. They have a health history questionnaire from the anesthesiologist that they'll wanna go over with you. And then they'll also have your medications in front of them and they'll let you know what medications to take the morning of surgery and not to take. You'll also get a call the day before surgery confirming what time we're gonna want you to be here. If your surgery is on a Monday, you'll get that call on Friday. It's usually early afternoon they're getting around to calling most people about what time they're gonna ask, ask that you arrive the next day. So let's say it's 2.30, 3 o'clock, you have not heard from them and it's that day before surgery, here are the phone numbers that you can call. Do not try to call those numbers a week in advance and ask them what time. We, we do not know until that day before surgery. What we'll to bring to the hospital? We do want you to bring your own comfortable, loose fitting clothing. You will have some swelling after surgery, so jeans aren't a real great choice. It'd be best to have elastic drawstring type of waistbands and shorts are preferred. That allows us to see your leg, to see your healing and um, the, the incision area. And outpatient therapy for total knees does like you to wear shorts to those appointments. Uh, T-shirt, sweatshirt, button up, whatever you wanna wear on top is fine. Nice sturdy footwear is also important. Shoes without a back are not ideal. So flip flops, Crocs, don't wear any of those. A nice sturdy shoe with a solid back on it. You'll need to bring your photo ID and your, and your insurance cards when you check in for surgery. Any medication changes, please keep track of that. We will ask you again about your medications when you get to the hospital for surgery. Also bring that joint camp book. That book has a lot of valuable information in it, including the discharge teaching, so it's helpful that you have that and we can go through that with you again here in the hospital. If you already have a walker or crutches that you plan to use after surgery, please bring those with you as we'll wanna make sure that they are adjusted correctly to your height and in good working order. If you do not already have a walking aid, don't worry, we will send you home from the hospital with what you need. The type of walker, which most people use a walker after surgery, is pictured here. It's a standard metal walker, wheels on the front, no wheels on the back. Other things we'll want you to bring with you is if you use a sleep CPAP type machine for breathing at night if you have sleep apnea, make sure you bring all that equipment. If you have any incontinence issues or concerns, bring your own pads or briefs. They're a lot more comfortable than the items we have here in the hospital. All your medications should stay home. Do not bring those to the hospital with you. Only bring the list of what you normally take, plus a lot of valuables, credit cards, cash, large amounts of cash and stuff, jewelry. Leave those at home as well. You're only going to be here one night. The day of the surgery, you'll park outside the main entrance doors. There is a revolving door for our main entrance doors that you'll come in. The earliest anyone's ever asked to be here for surgery is 5.30 in the morning. And those doors are open by then. So whatever time you're told to be here, you'll come in those doors and head straight to the registration area where they'll get you checked in. And after they've gotten you checked in, a nurse will come get you to bring you to a room where we will start prepping you for surgery. We do ask that you limit one to two guests at a time during this process. Pre-surgery holding area is where the nurse will have you change into a patient gown for surgery. They'll get an IV started so that we can give you fluids through the IV to help keep you hydrated. We'll also be giving you some other medications prior to surgery like an antibiotic to help prevent infection. There's medications they give you for nausea, for pain, for minim to minimize blood loss, all uh, either through the IV or orally prior to your surgery. Any loose items that you have, piercings, jewelry, hairpins, glasses, hearing aids, dentures, contacts, we do ask that you remove those so they don't get lost or caught in on anything while we're doing surgery. And nail polish, we do need to be able to see your fingers and your toes to assess circulation. So please remove all nail polish, unless it's a clear coat, that would be fine as long as we can see the nail beds. 
In this pre-surgery holding area, your orthopedic surgeon will also come visit with you, go over any last minute questions or concerns you may have, and then they will ask you to confirm which leg you're to do sur he's gonna do surgery on so that he can write his initials on, his, on that leg. And then we all know we have the correct leg when we see his initials there. And then the anesthesiologist will also come in and see you prior to surgery. That's the only time you'll meet your anesthesiologist before surgery is, is right um, here in the hospital. So you'll, they'll assess you and discuss the spinal anesthetic or general anesthetic that we'll be able to do to keep you comfortable for surgery. Spinal anesthetic is by far the most popular choice because there's a lower risk for infections, a lower risk of blood clots and pulmonary embolisms, no sore throat or hoarseness after surgery, less post-operative nausea and vomiting, lower pain scores, decreased bleeding, and a quicker wake-up time. A spinal is extremely safe. If patients even remember getting it, they report it feeling the same discomfort-wise as when the IV was started in their hand or their arm. It's a little pinch and burn, but it goes away pretty quickly. Your anesthesia provider is with you at all times during surgery to make sure you're nice and comfortable. This is the preferred method by the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and the American Society of Anesthesiologists. So not only the most popular choice here, it is anywhere you were to go to have a hip or knee replacement. A spinal anesthetic alone without sedation is enough to keep you comfortable during surgery. But who really wants to be awake during surgery? Not most people. So um, they can, you could get through it if you really wanted to without sedation, but most prefer some sedation. So that deeper sedation, very similar to if you ever had a colonoscopy before, I like to call it I don't care medicine. It makes you very sleepy and you probably won't remember much of what happens. General anesthetic is the next option, and in some cases, the preferred choice. Um, I know that Dr. Adder Bigby, when he does the direct anterior hip approach, he prefers his done under general anesthetic since his approach does take a little bit longer to perform. If you've ever had low back surgery before, sometimes that can interfere with them being able to do a spinal, so then they might have to do general anesthetic. The biggest difference we probably notice is the drowsiness. General anesthetic patients are more drowsy after surgery than our spinal patients are. Once we've taken a patient back for surgery, we'll have the coach or family wear a sticker that says primary contact. That way we know who we can give update, updates to while the loved one is in surgery. If you wanna leave coach to go get breakfast or lunch, that's fine. Just let the girls at the desk know that you're heading out. We wanna make sure we have a phone number or a way to reach you. When the surgeon is done with surgery, he will come out and give you an update, coach, on how the surgery went. It really usually only takes the surgeon an hour, maybe an hour and a half to do the surgery. Even though he's out updating you, doesn't mean patients are out of the operating room yet. The physician assistant usually, usually does the closing touches of the incision, and then patients will go to the recovery room. They'll be there at least an hour, uh, could be longer, just depending on how things are going. Nurses there will be monitoring patients closely with IV fluids and oxygen, checking vital signs. EKG monitoring is just monitoring the heart rhythm. And x-ray will also come take a picture of the new joint for the surgeon to look at. Once anesthesia and nursing say, hey, it's, you're doing great and you can leave the recovery room, they're gonna take you to the orthopedic unit where you're going to stay the night. This is where nursing and therapy will start working with you pretty shortly after you get there to meet those goals that we mentioned earlier so that you can return home safely. So now that you've checked off all the boxes here at the hospital, you're good to go home, what's next? What, when total knees are discharged home after surgery, the surgeons do want you continuing without patient physical therapy. It's very important to work on getting that range of motion back in your knee after the surgery. So the goals are zero degrees extension, that's a flat straight leg, and 120 degrees flexion, which is the bend that you can get in your leg. And you will need help with that from the physical therapist. So do schedule your appointment now. Call wherever it is you wanna go for therapy. Tell them which knee you're having done and who your surgeon is and you need your first appointment. You should have that first appointment scheduled for the next business day after your anticipated discharge. So surgery on a Monday means you're discharging Tuesday, Wednesday you're starting outpatient therapy. Surgery on Tuesday, discharging Wednesday, Thursday you're starting outpatient therapy. 
If they ask you if you have an order, just reassure them you will have that order. We give it to you at discharge. You just need to schedule an appointment for now. Total hips. Most total hips don't need to continue with formal physical therapy after they leave the hospital. If your surgeon does want you to do therapy, they will have instructed you on that. So if they did, go ahead and get it set up. But for the most part, hips go home. They do the exercises we've taught them here in the hospital and they walk. And the more you walk, the better you start to feel. Now at your two week follow-up appointment, if you are struggling with your gait pattern, you're walking, the surgeon or the physician assistant at that time might get you started on therapy. But for the most part, hips do pretty well with that exercise and walking routine at home. Seeing your surgeon, you should have a follow-up appointment scheduled with your surgeon's office for 10 to 14 days after surgery. Most have it do it around 14 days. So if you don't already have that first follow-up scheduled, go ahead and give your surgeon's office a call to get an appointment. Just keep in mind after that, they'll wanna see you again around six to eight weeks, again around three to four months, and again, probably right around that year mark for routine follow-up and x-rays, just to make sure everything's going well with your recovery process. Other frequently asked questions, how long does the surgery last? I kind of already mentioned that a little bit earlier, but usually only an hour, hour and a half it does to do this uh, surgery. Dr. Adder Big Beast, who does that anterior approach, it does take a, long, a little bit longer, more like two, two and a half hours for him. Uh, will I need a urinary catheter? I hope not. Those are a source of infection, so we try not to use them. You should be able to get up and urinate on your own just fine after surgery. Blood transfusions are also pretty rare nowadays. These surgeries are done with pretty minimal blood loss. Um, if you are having symptoms of blood loss, uh, like that your hemoglobin is low, you're feeling lightheaded or dizzy, and they think you need a blood transfusion, they'll talk to you about it, but we really don't see a whole lot of them. When can I drive? That is a question that will have to go back to your surgeon. Since it does take six weeks for those deeper soft tissues to heal, they might not want you driving for quite a while. Now after surgery, depending on right leg versus left leg and your narcotic usage and how you're actually moving, those will all uh, hopefully help them decide when and if it'll be okay to drive. Uh, resuming intimacy, again, you don't wanna get yourself in a compromising position that could delay that. So talk to your primary doctor or your surgeon or your physical therapist. Give yourself four or six weeks time to heal as well. The email system, the supportive emails that we do are really great. It's one of the highest compliments we get. We will have already registered for you, th th those for you, so you will start getting some emails from us with some great tips on preparing you for surgery and letting you know what's normal, not normal after your surgery. If you have any questions or concerns, you can call us or email us, and this contact information is also in your book. Thank you for taking the time to view this presentation.